Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Madhu Venugopal. Uh, my title is Senior Director of Networking at Docker Inc. Uh, it's going to be a deep dive session on Docker networking. And this particular topic on application plane to data plane is very close to my heart. Uh, if you look at the history of how I joined Docker, you will realize why it is close to my heart. Uh, so I happen to be the founder of Socket Plane, which Docker acquired. So the idea of the company, the name of the company's name, Socket Plane, uh, is to bring applications close to networking and networking close to applications. Where, uh, in my past experience, networking has been really complicated. So application stack doesn't even go near networking uh, configurations. So the, the Socket Plane's goal is to bring make networking easier for application stack to make use of. So in this talk, I would be going to go deeper into uh, various layers and unpack the planes and figure out how Docker makes use of networking to make it simple for all of you to write applications on top of Docker. So some bookkeeping uh, before we begin. So this is a one hour talk, 60 minutes, not 45 minutes. So uh, if you guys have to leave early, it's fine. Uh, remember to vote so that others who have missed this talk today can have an opportunity to not attend it again on Thursday if they have enough votes. And also, if you are, if you are interested in following the slides, the slide URL is there. We have a QR code. Just capture the link and start uh, downloading it. It's fine. So b before we dig now deeper into the net networking aspects of Docker, let me give you some, uh, some high-level overview of what are the various dimensions and various views of networking from various individuals and various uh, groups. This is an application dimension. Uh, and uh, this is Networking 101. Whoever knows networking will have heard about OSA layering. OSA layering is made of seven layers, from application layer to you know, network, data link, and physical layer. So this is a beautiful model for networking to follow. Uh, the idea is that each layer has its own functionality and is con contained in that, in that layer so that innovation can happen on the particular layer and interfaces can come, interfaces can, uh, can be worked out, so each layer can operate on its own. That's the fundamental OSA model, which is really beautiful. It still stays real, you know, real after decades of its existence. But it's a beautiful dream, right? The real thing that actually took off is the TCP IP. TCP IP is actually was living this dream. So TCP IP actually collapsed this OSA layer into four layers, the application layer, transport, network, and data link. It's pretty simple. And because of this simplicity, we got multiple protocols that just bloomed out of the TCP IP stack. We have HTTP, DNS, SSH, and so on and so forth. And uh, every application that we know today, especially microservice architecture applications, we will know about what HTTP is, what DNS is all about, because every application interacts with networking through these protocols already, you know, right from your code, uh, code perspective. The application stack depends on the transport layer, which is TCP and UDP, the most prominent one. And still, even today, if you create a socket, you still talk about TCP. You, you are at the socket layer. The, the TCP is at the socket layer at this point. And transport layer assumes that there is an underlying network layer, which is IP, IPv6, our protocol, so on and so forth, and comes Ethernet, right? As we go down the stack layer, application is least interested in the data link layer, if you look at it, right? So who, why do we care about Ethernet, uh, MAC addresses, and so on and so forth? Uh, one thing to pay attention here is the coloring scheme. So yeah, I, I add a lot of color here in this, in this talk, just for the fact that it's going to be a deep dive, so I'm going to go across layers and go across planes. So when you see this, this green color, you should assume that I'm talking about application dimension here, right? So next comes the infrastructure dimension. Um, so when application views networking in this OSA layer, the network operators, or those who actually manage networks, see it in a different dimension. So networks are, have the management plane, control plane, and data plane. Management plane, when we say management plane, we mean how we manage the network. How do we operate the network? When somebody creates a VLAN, when somebody creates a VXLAN, how do we use it? How do we manage these VLANs? And uh, using the UX, CLI, or REST APIs, and, uh, using SNMP, so on and so forth, they all belong to the management plane. Then comes the control plane. This is where the, the real stuff begins, actually. So the control plane, 
is the signaling between various network entities, like routers or switches, uh, which exchanges states, the routing states. So if there is a host in host one, another host coming up in host two, the way they know about each other using the control plane protocols, like the OSPF, BGP, and in Docker we use gossip mechanism for that, so on and so forth. Uh, and in recent days, there was the SDN uh, explosion happened in the past decade. And in SDN world, we talk about centralized control planes, like the OpenFlow, OVSDB, and so on and so forth. This, we, so we kind of narrowed down into a control plane, and we concentrated on the control plane architecture. Then comes the data plane. Data plane is the actual moment of pa packets from application. So if you have an application uh, that you've written in, you know, uh, it's running in a VM or running in a bare metal or running in containers, it doesn't matter. When two applications talk to each other, it is data plane. So we use various protocol, various mechanisms today. So from Cisco's hardware or you know, uh, other vendors' hardware mechanism to power traffic like the Ceph, FIB, so on and so forth, to IP tables, IPVS, OBS, DPDK, so on and so forth, uh, even Microsoft uh, VFPs, right? All those come under the data plane, uh, the, 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 that plane where, which actually helps us move traffic from A to B, right? So we see that we have an infrastructure view of networking and an application view of net networking here. If we have these two different views, we can never, we can never come up with an easy to use networking architecture ever. So a Docker, we actually see them as a multidimensional view and try to make it simpler by providing a three-dimensional view of networking. Providing this, providing the infrastructure and applications can work seamlessly without any you know, conflicts there. So, and hence, Docker networking added a lot of features. As you, as you know, for the past couple of years, we've been working hard on this. We have application services, like service discovery and load balancing that comes out of the box of network, in Docker networking. We have pluggable network drivers, unbuilt-in drivers, like overlay, MacVLAN, bridge drivers, and also remote plugins like you know, Cisco has this Conte Weave as a Weave plugin, you know, uh, VMware has an NSX plugin, so on and so forth. And we also have a built-in management plane. So the management plane is the, the most com the popular Docker uh, CLIs and APIs. So Docker network commands are part of the management plane. And we also have the Docker stack and compose files. So today when you create a, a stack, I mean, when you launch, deploy a stack, you can see that networks are being created, networks can be configured, so on and so forth. It's another way of managing the network. Uh, Docker networking also has built-in control plane. We have gossip-based protocol. And data plane, we have encrypted mechanism, and everything's encrypted into one. And you, you would have heard in the previous uh, talk, also in the keynote, about how important that Docker gives for the, for the security aspects of Docker Swarm mode. And uh, thanks to Swarm mode, we can provide seamless, easy to use, encrypted control plane and data plane. That's, the, that's, that's how Docker networking views of the world, and then uh, how, is, how we can provide this multidimensional view of networking for even developers to make use of. Starting now, let's go, let's go deeper into, the, into various aspects of this, the, both the layers and the planes. I will try to go, I, I will not stop right now, I will not try to explain at a plane level now at this point. From now on, we're going to see how we achieve this multidimensional view of Docker networking. Uh, so let's start with this uh, simple application stack. So for simplicity, I removed the images and so on and so forth. I'm concentrating purely on the network aspects of this. So if you have seen the compose file, it will typically look like this. We have a version tag, and we have services. We have web service, app, and DB. Uh, web service typically exposes a port. Port uh, 80 is exposed and published on port 8080 on the, on the cluster. Um, it is connected to one network called the front-end network, and it has de deployed. It is a replica of two, meaning this service will have two tasks on the cluster. Uh, we have an app service connected to two networks, front-end and back-end, and DB connected only to the back-end. So now we have this kind of micro-segmentation in place where DB uh, service can be accessed only on the DB network, and the web service can be accessed only on the front-end network. So we kind of have the isolation in place. And as you can see, we can also define this network uh, 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 tag here, and you can specify what kind of driver that you want to deploy your uh, stack on. It's optional. If you want to add, you can add it. And as you can see, the encrypted true makes this data plane also encrypted. We provide IPsec out of the box. So when you, when you do a stack deploy, 
This is where the, the management plane kind of starts here. So when, when you execute this stack deploy, you can see the networks are being created, services are being created, and you can also see the redo network LS, and service LS, you can see these net created networks and services all launched and running in the Docker Swarm cluster. Let's dig a little bit deeper into what does what the stack deploy does, right? So now, from application layer standpoint, the green color one, yeah, we are doing a Docker stock deploy, and then the management plane takes over. And when the management plane takes over, in, this, in, the, in the case of Swarm mode, create network just a pure manager-only operation. It doesn't do anything, it doesn't touch the worker nodes, the worker even, doesn't even know the network is being created, because there's no service being launched yet. So when there's no service attached to a particular network, it is a manager-only operation, and at the manager, it will reserve some resources. For example, if user doesn't care about a particular subnet for a network, then the form manager will allocate a subnet and reserves it for this particular network to make use of. Similar to similar same case with VXLAN IDs and so on and so forth. It has no impact on data plane yet. When the service is launched, this is where things get very interesting there. So when service is launched, manager again reserves a service IP, like the virtual IP and the individual IPs for the tasks. So we use IPAM driver, so we can call the IPAM driver. It can be a built-in driver or a plugin. The IPAM driver provides an IP for the service VIP or the task IPs. Once the manager gets it, we will schedule the uh, tasks across the cluster, and then the control plane takes over. That's why the, the orange color there. So the control plane takes over. Once the control plane takes over, control plane actually starts to distribute the information across the cluster for service registration. Since we have the embedded DNS server, uh, we have the service name to VIP binding, task name to task IP binding, and uh, there is an, another endpoint called tasks.service name, where we'll return all the IPs uh, of, the, of, the, you know, uh, of the service. So all this exchange between these worker nodes happens thanks to the gossip mechanism we have. So Docker networking today by default has a the gossip mechanism, we use uh, uh, a software called MemberList. MemberList is built based on a SWIM uh, papers. If you are interested into deeper into the SWIM mechanism, you can read about it. Uh, we will need much more than one hour to dig, dig deeper into those aspects of control plane. It's really interesting. Read about that. Uh, so we use that. And the most importantly, control plane helps to prepare the data plane. Uh, we will go deeper into what I, what I mean by that, but it's one of the control plane aspects of the, the stack. Uh, in order to do all of this, we have to, of course, call the driver APIs. The driver APIs include the overlay driver, built-in overlay driver, or the MacVillan driver, or the plugins that the vendor provides. And we also help exchange the driver states if the driver prefers uh, the Docker control plane to be made use of. So from a management plane standpoint, the way SwarmKit operates today is with uh, uh, multiple uh, 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 layers here. So we have orchestrator, allocator, scheduler, and dispatcher. There are various pipelines, stages that SwarmKit uh, goes through. When it, for the network create, as you can see, the network create uh, reaches only the allocator's pipeline and allocates the resources and just stays there. When the, when the service create happens, it goes to the orchestrator. Orchestrator requests the allocator to allocate states for service VIP and task uh, IPs. Then it goes over the scheduler and dispatcher. At the dispatcher stage is when that the, the uh, task has been distributed to the, the worker nodes. So in, in, in the case of uh, Docker, the, the, uh, since the managers are available, we can, the states can be mutated. That's management plane. So in the control plane aspect, as you can see here, Control plane is completely decentralized. Management plane is centralized. Manager schedules the uh, information to the worker nodes, and then it just stays there. But control plane is decentralized, and there are two scopes to the control plane today. We have swarm scoped gossip and network scoped gossip. It's, it's extremely important to understand this one because in a swarm scoped gossip, it's cluster wide. Every single node in the cluster gets these distributed states. The only state that we use today in Docker for this swarm scoped gossip is to, to advertise the fact that a new worker node has joined or left. That's all to it. So this 
Swamp's code gossip is used very minimally just to announce a new worker node adder or not. But Netoscope gossip is where we segment the gossip uh, broadcast messages, not across the cluster, rather we send it to only to those worker nodes where there are tasks uh, run, run, running on that. So in this example, we have two gossips here. Uh, one is the worker one, worker two, worker three, they forms one Netoscope gossip. And the worker one, five, four, they form another gossip. So even if we have, if, if you have a uh, application where you have to restrict your network exchanges to a particular set of nodes, then Docker automatically does the, the, the network scope gossip for you, depending on where the tasks are running. And uh, the gossip mechanism is eventually consistent. It is not fully consistent to begin with. And the states are distributed through decentralized events, as I was explaining before. And the states are distributed, the states that, uh, that is part of the events are the service discovery mechanism, like the one that I explained in the previous slide, the service named IP binding, load balancer configurations, routing states, pretty much that's it. We use these three states to be exchanged between the worker nodes, only to those workers where the tasks are scheduled for a given network. It's scoped to a particular network. And the convergence is really fast. It's an order of login. The entire cluster will be converged based on the data that you have. And the gossip is extremely scalable. It's highly scalable. Uh, since it is not fully consistent, eventually consistent, we can we can afford to be highly scalable. Uh, and the gossip mechanism today uses UDP for exchanging the information, and also TCP for syncing the you know uh, for consistency. And the important aspect of uh, the gossip is that you don't need managers. Even if the manager goes down, the containers continue to run. They continue to talk to each other because we are fully decentralized. We don't need the manager to be available for the the gossip to run. It's an important uh, aspect of, uh, of this event. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the state dissemination. This is important to understand, being a deep dive. You don't have to know about all this, just that it's, when you, when you have a problem, if you want to understand what's going on deep dive, this is what happens behind the scenes. When a state is created, so it doesn't matter what state it is, in this case, we have service, service discovery states, we have driver states, we have load balance state, doesn't matter. At the control plane level, a state is created on node A. The node A broadcasts the state to three different nodes, all that belong to the same network scope. Random nodes, doesn't matter. And these random nodes will accept the, the, the packet only if the LAMP port time is greater than what it already knows. So essentially, it's a way for us to make sure that uh, the nodes doesn't accept all the traffic from everybody. We make sure that we filter it out. It's, it's, not, it's done by, mem by member list automatically. It's a swim mechanism to make sure that the broadcast is no, no We cut the broadcast if there's a loop uh, happening in the network. Uh, so the lamp port time is um, is a is a is a clock that is used as one of the fields in the in the member list message. And one and these random nodes will again. Pro propagated to three three different nodes. It's like a like a pyramid scheme. So traffic just the the event gets spread across the entire cluster in log n convergence time. Yeah. So we use UDP for doing all this, and we all know UDP is unreliable. So member list also have this backup mechanism for periodic bulk sync. So periodically, uh, the node will sync the states to another random node. So one node just periodically syncs it. That way, even if there's a UDP packet loss, the bulk sync will take care of the, the, the lost states. So the states will be synchronous eventually. So this is the control plane that we use today for uh, exchanging states when a service comes up, task comes up on nodes, other, other, uh, other nodes immediately knows about it because of this, this dissemination. And the important thing to note, it's all encrypted by default. So none of this stuff you can tap and get the information. It's all encrypted, and uh, Swarm also provides key rotation, and this encrypted traffic with key rotation, so key will be rotated periodically, so you just cannot hack into it or inject traffic into it. That's another important information to, you know, to, uh, to understand. We have end-to-end fully encrypted from management plane to data plane. Now, with that information in mind, let's take an example of, hey, we deployed a stack before. Let's see what's going to happen here. Uh, so in this case, I have three worker nodes. They all exchange uh, gossip. And the service has been created. 
uh, the service, uh, we have web, uh, app, and DB. We have task one of web is launched on worker one. Task two dot web and task one of app was in, uh, were in worker two. Worker three got the task one dot DB, of course. And the IP address has been allocated and distributed there. You can see that the IP address of the demo front end comes from 10.01 network, while the IP address for worker three, which is the, uh, the backend network here, backend network is 10.02 X network. And we, as I explained before, Docker provides the DNS server. The DNS server is embedded into Docker daemon itself, so I just represented there, just as an, uh, just to know what is maintaining the states. Now, with this uh, OLA network in place and the task being scheduled, when the gossip mechanism happens, the states get spread across only to those nodes, again, so, uh, where the states must belong to. So here, the server discovery states of these, uh, the web and app, which belong to the front end network, are distributed between worker one and worker two. And you can see the web is, the IP, it's consistent across the, across the network, across the two worker nodes. The service discovery states are consistent. We have the task IPs, the, the, web, the virtual IPs for the service as well. If you look at the routing states, routing states is managed by the drivers. Drivers use the gossip mechanism of the, provided by lib network to exchange the states. So in the routing states, as you can see, they are not consistent, they don't have to be, because the if you, uh, routing states are required for sending traffic from A to B. That's what routing states meant for. So here, what we are, what, what routing states for the overlay driver states that in order to reach an IP address 10.0.1.6, you reach, you go to worker node worker two, and having the VXLAN ID 4079, 4097, sorry. Similarly, if you look at the worker two, in order to reach 10.0.1.5 IP address, you have to go to worker one and 14.97 again here. Now, it clearly shows that at the data plane level, at the driver states, driver state doesn't care about service discovery. It doesn't really care about what is the name of the container. It doesn't care about what is the name of the service. All it cares about is the IP address that I want to reach. That's all it cares about. And how I'm going to reach it. What is the next stop for that? While service discovery, it doesn't care about whether it's VXLAN driver, whether it is VLAN, it doesn't care about it, right? That's the layering they're talking about here, right? We clearly separated layers for various, uh, various planes, and the states are ap appropriately exchanged. It's up to the Docker networking stack to make sense out of all this. So now let's look at the next uh, uh, network, very similar. For that network, we have exchanged the similar states only for network two, the, the, the backend net overlay network. And worker three will not know anything about front end network, while worker one will not know anything about the back end network. That's the idea. Now, we got the, you know, the exchange done, and I said it's encrypted. How do we actually troubleshoot this information, right? So it's, it's all cool, it's all working great, until it fails, right? If it fails, how do we troubleshoot this one? Yeah, so we added some uh, deep dive information in the Docker network uh, command line. If you do a Docker network inspect dash V, dash V is important, the verbose command, you, you get to know all the states being exchanged by the control plane. In this case, you can see that network has been created with an overlay driver and option is the, with, with the uh, uh, VXLAN ID option is for this particular network. It will also show the peers. So you can see here that even though we have a three node cluster here, we just see only two peers because of the network scope gossip. For this network, you have only two peers. What is the name, what is the IP to reach that? And you also see all the services that belong to this network with the virtual IP, load balancer index, and the tasks that also belong to this network. So you have all the information, even though the task doesn't belong to this particular node, even though the service doesn't belong to this particular node, you get the information. So now, if there's any issue, the first thing to do is do this Docker network inspect dash P to figure out whether the control plane actually worked or not. So that's the, that's the first step towards troubleshooting such kind of complex uh, you know, software that's running in the, in the code, in the uh, engine. Now, the troubleshooting, the, the control plane is great. I mean, it, yeah, we have a good control plane there. How do we make use of it? So this is the same slide back. So we exchange states, states are exchanged, it's ready to go. Now let's look at how service discovery works. Let's, let's dissect more into how the DNS lookup happens in Docker. So in this case, the states are exchanged, there's a Docker daemon, 
it has a DNS server. DNS server is currently populated with all the states exchanged by the gossip mechanism. It's right there. And we have the task one.web, who it wants to reach, hey, I want to resolve app. It doesn't care about an IP address, because we are talking about the application state now, right? Application really doesn't care about IP addresses. It cares about the name. I want to resolve this name. How do I reach it? Resolve it for me. The first thing that happens is it looks up, any software looks up the resolve.conf in Linux. In Windows, we have the equivalent there. It works very similarly there, too. It looks up the, the resolve.conf. In the resolve.conf, you see that name server is populated as 127.0.0.11, okay? Now, it's an important segue for me to explain certain things here. The contain, so if you look at the Linux uh, uh, stack, namespaces are important. Network namespace is important for the networking stack, of course. The lib network has two layers to it. The lib network core networking stack and also the driver states. So driver manages the host networking stack, right? While lib network core manages the container networking stack. So anything inside the container namespace is managed by lib network core. And hence, if you look at the lib network, even though the container is launched by any other any driver, we will automatically configure the name server as 127.0.0.11 so that when the query happens, when the query of app happens, it will go to 127.0.0.11. And since the lib network core manages the, the container namespace, we can redirect the request coming to 127.0.0.11 with 53, which is the DNS thing, send it to uh, a DNAT, uh, DNAT it and redirect the packet to the, to the Docker daemon, right? So it goes to Docker daemon, and Docker daemon can actually do the, the DNS lookup and respond back with an answer saying, hey, okay, you are looking for app, app, the IP address is 10.0.1.8. As you can see, 10.0.1.8 is a virtual IP because in this case, we created a service with a default service create uses virtual IP and the IP comes back to the, uh, to the container and container can do the next next stage, right? Look up and forwarding, things like that, right? Now, there's one more um, uh, option in Docker. If, for whatever reason, you don't want to use the virtual IP, you want to continue using the DNS RR, you can still do that. You can create a service today with endpoint mode as DNS RR. When you use a DNS RR, this Docker, uh, this swarm manager will not create a virtual IP. Rather, it will use multiple IPs. You'll use the multiple A records and return all the IP addresses to the, to the service. In case where it's used, in some, some cases where they don't want to use virtual IPs, they want to use raw physical IPs of the tasks, you can do that as well. In this case, the, the, uh, this, the, the request from the application looks exactly the same. Application will not even know whether the service is created by a virtual IP or a, or a DNS RR. The only difference would be that when the, when the, DNA, when the Docker daemon responds to the query, it's going to have multiple IP addresses. But if you look at the IP address, it's exactly the same as the, the task IPs. It just combines together and then returns back to the application here. So the application doesn't really care about it. Just use, makes, use of, makes use of it and then sends the packet out, right? Now, so uh, till, the, till here, we just uh, looked up into how the states are exchanged, how this exchange state is being used by uh, the Docker stack in order to help with the service discovery. With this state, the, the name, we have resolved the service name to an IP that the packet has to be forwarded to. That comes, that gets us into the data plane on how this IP is resolved into whatever is required by the driver and the traffic actually get forwarded to A to B, right? Now, the most important thing to understand is that the drivers provide data plane, right? Liberator core doesn't provide data plane. It's the drivers does, that, that, that do the job. So there are multiple drivers built in in Docker, like the bridge driver, host, Mac VLAN, null, overlay. These are built-in drivers. And also we have plugins like Contiv plugin or V plugins, so on and so forth. They all can provide the actual taking the traffic from A to B, right? Now, server discovery was, again, is server discovery and load balancing is part of Docker core while the actual data plane of sending packet from A to B belongs to the driver. Driver does the actual job. So for this, for this uh, presentation, I want to talk about overlay networking uh, because it provides default multi-host networking out of the box, but the same explanation can be, same concept can be used for other drivers as well, but the actual implementation of other drivers can vary, right? That's, that's the only difference between the built-in driver and the, the plugins that the others have. Uh, to give a short example of what overlay networking is, overlay networking provides simple and secured multi-host networking. It 
it's it's a way for you to just uh, not worry about networking at all. Just write an application, use only networking, and things should just work. Ideally, I see some smirks here. Of course, uh, ideally yes. And uh, hopefully after this talk, you will be able to debug any issues that you might face. All right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, so in, simply put, today's Docker overlay networking makes use of a technology called VXLAN. VXLAN is an industry standard used by not just uh, Docker, it's used by every vendor that I know today, from, you know, from uh, the VMware to Microsoft to Cisco to hardware vendors to software vendors. All of us use VXLAN as a way for us to do virtual networking today. For VXLAN uh, to work, it's actually a tunnel on top of an existing underlying network. VXLAN works with, uh, with beat up endpoints on the, on the actual host. So you can have the tunnels running across the network on top of an, on top of an existing uh, no, layer 3 space. So essentially you can have containers running on L2 space on top of an L3 network. So let's try to build an OLA network from ground up. In OLA networking, the first thing we do is we'll create a network namespace for the network to operate. It's not for containers. For the network to operate, we create the namespace for individual network. And uh, if, you have, if you know what bridge networking is today, it's very similar to that, just that the bridge is created inside the network namespace. So if you go to the actual host and do an if config or bridge, you won't see this bridge, because the bridge is actually created inside a namespace. Okay? Now, after a few slides, I'll explain how to go into a namespace, how to debug things. We can, we can discuss a lot more about that. Once the bridge is created, we also create the VTAP. The VTAP endpoint is 4789 and port UDP is by VXLAN. And VXLAN tunnel is created between two nodes. Or it's, it's a multi-point VXLAN tunnel. Just for explanation, we, we just call, uh, we showcase a tunnel here. And tunnel is running on top of the underlay transport, which is on layer three, doesn't matter. The containers are created, IP addresses are allocated from completely random space, as you can see here, right? It's 10.0.0.3. It really doesn't matter what the IP address is here, because we don't actually interact with the underlay at all here. It's completely on top of it. So we can allocate any IP address that we want to. Uh, similar to bridge network, uh, we create VETH, and the VETH is attached to the container to the bridge here. Now, if from a container perspective, container will not know anything about which network I'm belonging to. All I have is a VETH. That's all I care about. The plumbing underneath is happens completely by the driver. So it's, it's whether it's OLED driver or Mac VLAN, Container doesn't know about it. And the traffic can seamlessly go from container one to container two, right? Um, so once you have the IP address, of course, IP address doesn't just let the traffic go out. We need to do an ARP request. ARP request results to a MAC address, and MAC address is where, once you have MAC address, we can do the layer two encap and send it out, right? That's, that's a common uh, network, network mechanism. But the, the, the tricky part is we don't support our, we don't support broadcast in the in the VXLAN OLED driver today. Since we don't support broadcast, ARP will not work, right? That's all we all we all know that. Since ARP doesn't work, automatically we had to do something about it. And in OLED driver, we added the proxy ARP support, right? Where we will pre-populate the pro, the ARP cache on the VXLAN driver on individual nodes. So once we have the gossip protocol exchanged, once we know that hey this particular IP belongs to the particular uh, uh, neighbor, and uh, we have the MAC, we actually populate the ARP with the information that is already gossiped, right? And that's why when in the initial slides I was explaining that we had to prepare the data plane, this is what it means. Once the control plane is exchanged, we need to program the data plane to make sure that when the actual packet starts arriving from the application stack, it actually get delivered to the right, right place, right? So it's all, it's all taken care, and after that, traffic can go seamlessly. And one thing to note is that Docker networking is Linux networking. So we, have, we didn't write the proxy ARP code. We didn't write the OLA driver code. It's all actually given by the Linux kernel community and uh, Windows kernel as well. Now we support OLA and Windows as well, right? So Docker as a platform actually assembles this awesome work done by the community and make it easy for all of you to make use of. That's, that's our job, actually. So we have taken at least, like, eight or 10 components of networking stack in Linux kernel, and just put them together in easy to use for fashion. So in, again, let's go to the debugging thing. This is the most complicated one, where everything will work till it breaks. When it breaks, it's just very hard to debug, right? So I have top 10 commandments that I use to me, right? This is some commandments there. So 
10 commands, we use this, I can pretty much say we can debug pretty much any issues in, in networking at the, at least at the uh, initial stages. Uh, of course, Docker network commands are important for um, the management level troubleshooting. NS Enter is a very important troubleshooting tool. If you want to enter into a namespace and start looking at what is going on, NS Enter is the tool for you. It's extremely helpful for debugging any sort of networking issues. TCP dump, I'm sure most of you would have known, is for capturing the packet to see what's going on. IP tables for uh, rules filtering, IPBS admin for IPBS load balancing, IP stack, bridge, drill, so on and so forth. It's just go back and read about it. And installing each tool is being a hard thing, and hence we have an all-in-one container for that. And thanks to Nico, who wrote this Netshoot uh, container, it's pretty flexible. Just use this container, and you can get inside any container, get inside any name, namespace, and start using these tools and make use of it. Very useful, actually. Now, let's use these commands, and let's unpack what the, the data plane has have offered to us for, with OLA networking. So if you look at the OLA data plane, of course, the network LS, we use it to understand what is the network, what is the network ID, and so on and so forth. In this case, network ID is very important because if you look at the namespace, as I said, every network, all network being created, will have an independent namespace for that. So that whatever we create inside the namespace is isolated for that particular network. So I can add IPVS rules, I can add IP table rules, all isolated for this particular network. Now, the, if you look at the network ID and the compared to the, the one highlighted there, you see that in var run docker netns, there is an one dash the, the network ID that represents the network namespace for this network. Now I can do an NS enter and log into this namespace, and I can do the BR cuttle commands to show what is the bridge. In this case, I have a bridge attached to VXLAN uh, interface and two VETH interfaces here, right here. Now I can do IP link commands to see what are the uh, various IP links here, like the bridge, uh, bridge interface, VETH, and so on and so forth. Also the VXLAN interface, right? So in, in, in Linux networking, as I said, everything is a link. So you can do an IP link command to understand about any given device, whether it is a VXLAN device, or a bridge device, or a VETH device, or a Mac VLAN device, it doesn't matter. Just IP link command, do a dash D for detailed information. You get everything, you get to know everything about a particular link, you know, all the information that you want to debug, uh, debug on. So this is the, the preparing state for the, uh, using the control plane. As I said, we do the proxy ARP. The command for that is IP-S neighbor show. So if you do that, it will show the neighboring uh, states for the ARP, uh, proxy ARP. You can see that we pre-program the, the state stating that if you want 10.0.0.6, the device is for the, in VXLAN 0, then the MAC address is going to be what are the MAC addresses. That way, when the ARP request comes up, the VXLAN driver will respond back to the, uh, to the container stating that, hey, you refer, look, you're looking for this IP, that's the MAC. You don't have to broadcast the ARP, you don't have to broadcast anymore, everything is done locally to that particular box. And if you look, look at the bridge FDB show, you can see that how to route the traffic for a given MAC. So if, if you get a MAC address, since VXLAN is a layer two network, as we all know, it looks a MAC address based lookup, and MAC address, VXLAN device, what is the destination IP, boom, the traffic goes out. So if you look at the VXLAN zero, we saw in the previous, in the previous slide, you see that the, the VXLAN ID is 1497. So what happens in VXLAN is we get the uh, VXLAN zero represents the 1497 VXLAN ID. So we get the MAC, uh, bridge does the lookup, encapsulated with the, 40, uh, the 1497 VXLAN ID, and the destination IP is 192.168.56.101, encapped in an UDP packet, and ships it across to the, ne to the next stop, right? That's exactly how it happens. So once it's packaged and shipped, the packet will reach the destination route node, so because we don't do the underlay. Underlay is done by the underlay network. If the underlay network works, the XLAN will work. That's the idea, right? So this is the end-to-end -end idea of how the data plane actually is programmed. It's all to it. So once the control plane converges, it programs the local nodes. If the con control plane is, is consistent, if it is eventually consistent, it will be consistent, then data plane will also you know, work accordingly. Now, 
we, we, we are looking only into the, the host namespace so far, right? This particular thing was outside the container namespace. It was happening in, inside the, uh, the network namespace of the OLA network. Now let's look, let, look inside what's happening inside the container namespace. So container, as we all know, container is made of multiple namespaces. Network namespace is one of them. And this one we saw already where, hey, I had uh, uh, three worker nodes with a few uh, tasks running on that. Originally, we, had, we, we were discussing only about the OLA network. Now, it also, when you create an OLA network and attach a container to that, you'll also get the default gateway bridge attached to that. So as you can see here, the container has two interfaces now, one to the OLA network, which is multi-host, another one is the default gateway bridge, that is single host. So every host will have its own default gateway bridge. Uh, so why do we do that? Uh, so default gateway bridge is the only way for the containers to reach outside. We call the north-south, right? If, if the container wants to reach outside the cluster, say if you want to do docker.com or google.com, it actually takes the default gateway bridge route. It doesn't take the overlay route. Because the overlay in Docker is purely an east-west connectivity. We don't have an VXLAN gateway concept in Docker. We use the default gateway on the existing single node and send the packet out. Right? So we make it simple. In other, other technologies of VXLAN, we have VXLAN gateway technology, but not in Docker so far. In so Docker, we use default gateway bridge to send the traffic out north-south. Now, let's get inside the container namespace and peek inside what is going on there. Uh, in the container namespace, if you do a Docker, net, Docker inspect on a container name and grip for the word key, you see there's something called a sandbox key. Sandbox key is the, the network namespace for the container. Just do a net uh, NS uh, and no, do an NS enter and get inside the namespace. And now you can see that we have two interfaces, ETH0 and ETH1. And ETH0 is for the overlay namespace and the overlay network. And ETH1 is for the default gateway bridge. Now, let's look into the load balancing. So why am I talking about load balancing in the container namespace is that load balancing actually happens inside the container namespace today. It doesn't happen in the overlay namespace. It doesn't happen in your in the uh, host namespace. The load balancing in Docker is at the, the client level. The client side load balancing happens at the no, at, at inside the containers namespace. It's important to understand here. Now, as you, as you saw before, server discovery worked. Server discovery gave you an IP, the virtual IP. When virtual IP is being looked up by the application to say, "Hey, I want to reach this virtual IP," the first thing happens is we have pre-programmed the IP table rule inside the container namespace to state that whenever you get any traffic on this virtual IP, you, you do an, uh, the, it's called a firewall marker. We mark the firewall, the, this is a uh, metadata field on the, on the Linux packet. We can say that, hey, mark this traffic to a load balancer index as five. Now comes the IPVS. IPVS is a cool technology, again, built in Linux for, for, for a few decades now very stable load balancer. All, all we do is we go and program the IPVS rules stating that if any traffic comes with a load balancer index of five, round robin between IP address 10.0.1.9 and 10.0.1.10, right? Those are the IP address of the task that we saw before, okay? And once it's done, contractor comes over and then make sure the TCP or UDP sessions has been managed appropriately, right? So when the traffic goes out of this container, now comes the, the one I explained before, OLA networking takes over, looks up the IP, the you know, Mac lookup, and so on and so forth, everything happens after that, right? So pretty much the load balancing is actually happening on the client side. Okay, this is this on, the, on the VIP. If you look at the fancy load balancer, again, tools like IP tables and IPVS, you can see that if you look at the mangle table, you can see that the the VIP will be marked to a different, uh, the I index, the index is the load balancer index. We call the, it is the firewall marker, but we use the load balancer index as a way to explain. And that is being mapped on the IPVS, uh, if you use IPVS admin, you can see that by the 0x101 maps to 257, and 0x100 on the, on the top maps to 256. It's a hexa to decimal conversion. You see that it hits the appropriate IPVS rules, and IPVS takes care of load balancing traffic appropriately at the layer four level. And if you look at the contractor, contractor actually tracks the, the, the packet from A to B, and if you look at it, that's, that's why it happens there. 
Okay, now, as I, as I was talking to you about before, about if you don't want to use a WIP, but you want to do a DNS RR, it's pretty simple. There's no IPv6 here. DNS uh, request comes back with the multiple uh, A records, and after that, this packet goes out. There's no IPv6 here, because, hey, we are already resolved to the task IPs, and the traffic just goes out. There's no, there's no, no change required there. So that's pretty much about the basic forwarding of traffic from A to B on what happens at the Docker level, right? Now, there's one more interesting feature that we added called routing mesh. It makes use of all the technologies I explained so far. It's exactly the same thing. The only difference is that in routing mesh, it doesn't matter where the, the container belongs to. Whenever a traffic has to come from north-south, right, from external to the cluster, to inside the cluster, if you want to reach a service, even though a container doesn't belong to a particular host, routing mesh actually knows how to route the traffic to the appropriate container where it belongs to, right? So that's the only difference here. How do we do that? Again, using IPBS, again, using the same technology experience so far. The traffic list load balance using the normal service deep load balancing, exactly the same. Okay, so in order to explain my next slide, uh, this is an, the important slide. Again, it's a homework for all of you. It's a deep dive session, as, as I warned you before. So, so take a look at this slide, take, take your time, read about it. This, it's all, this is exactly what we use today. It? As I said, Docker doesn't do the forwarding. Docker doesn't, uh, we didn't write this software. It's all by Linux kernel net filter rules, right? So read about it, it's very interesting. Uh, now, if you have gone through that, this slide will make more sense to you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a deep dive, guys. So, yeah. So, routing mesh, the, the way things happen is when the traffic comes in, we first do an IP table lookup. IP table lookup maps the published port to an ingress sandbox. An ingress sandbox is a network namespace, similar to what a container namespace is. And after that, it's going to be exactly the same as the container doing a load balancing using WIP. Right? There's no difference at all. Now, with that said, it's a homework for all of you that if you want to do, understand more about routing mesh, right, just go deep dive into routing mesh with all the commands I was showing you guys before. It's the exact same technology of IPBS, IP tables, you know, namespace, and so on and so forth. If you just take time, read through the NetFilter forwarding mechanism and the mechanism that I showed before, you can clearly, you know, you'll be able to actually do a packet walkthrough from A to B, even for routing mesh. It's pretty straightforward. If you have questions, I have a mingle offer open there. You guys can use it. You can tweet at me at Madhuvan Gopal. I'm on Slack, on community channel. I'm very active there. Your questions, shoot me there. I'm also here. We have 10 more minutes, I guess. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you so much. Oh, wait. No, it's fine. Just a reminder for those who are staying here, please vote. Uh, based on the word, maybe you can repeat it again if you want. And slides are there for make use of. Yeah, open for questions now. Amazing. Can we have a round of applause for Madhu? Um, so if anybody has questions, you can come up here and we can start passing the mic down. Hi, Madhu. Great hey. talk. Um, great work that you've done, especially with overlay networking and what have you. Um, and I love the depth that you went into with troubleshooting and what have you at the end, but it's really complex. Is, are there any plans to work on, like, I, I don't know, just better tooling to enable us to, to inspect and to troubleshoot and things like that? Uh, and as well, a second question. You talked about... Um, leveraging all of the existing networking technologies in the Linux kernel and stuff. Can you run um, Windows containers and Linux containers on the same overlay network? So just two questions. Okay, two questions. The first one about Linux, uh, the, the troubleshooting tools. Yeah, so we, we thought it's very simple to use, actually. Then we realized that it's not actually as simple for folks to actually operate this one. So we started adding troubleshooting tools. The first one, we did the dash V to expose all the information that we have. Uh, now, one of, my, one of the folks in my team is working on this awesome tool um, to actually uh, do the consistency checker across the, across the nodes and highlight where the problem is. If there's a problem, the tool will identify and highlight exactly where the problem is, right? It's going to be available shortly, which we'll, of course, uh, expose to everybody. 
And there's also one more tool written by one of the swarm kit maintainers. That's for, uh, uh, that's to figure out latency between the containers. So on a swarm node, you can just run the tool. It will figure out, it will spawn containers across the cluster and figure out if there's any latency parameters, if there's any issues with the, with connectivity and so on and so forth. So before you deploy your application, you can actually run this tool to make sure you have set up everything right, and then you can set up uh, brain tools. So yeah, we are spending a lot of time now to, to write proper troubleshooting tools. That's one of the top priority for us, and we realize it's important. The second question from Nijal is that, um, uh, whether can we run Linux and Windows workloads? Yes, so that's a, that's a good news now. So uh, as of a couple of days ago, Windows actually released the Windows Server 2016 patch. With that, all the networking is available in Windows as well. Now we can actually launch services on Windows and Linux running on the same all the networking. They can talk to each other seamlessly. It's beautifully working fine. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, great talk. Uh, my name's uh, Darren from Appfolio. Um, so I had a question for you on the request routing and load balancing stuff. So if you have a request that's incident upon the swarm in kind of the north-south sense, and you are deciding kind of when you land there which node should serve this request based on what you learned via the gossip protocol, it seems like you have, um, during this period between when health checks start failing and when uh, your sort of gossip protocol converges on like the new set of healthy nodes, you're kind of paying this overhead in the sense of like, where it lands, the request could fail, but also you could land on a healthy node, do this coin tossing, say, and 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 and, and also hit an unhealthy node, right, or the one unhealthy node. Is that true? So, um, as of uh, Docker seventeen o three, we added the service, uh, the lo the health check mechanism. Okay. So the health check mechanism, because of our container, is actually fed inside the load balancer configuration. So, if a container is deemed unhealthy. We'll remove it from the load balancer, right? So that way, we don't actually, we don't have the node as a part of the uh, routing mesh at all after that. Right, I just mean like during that convergence time, when uh -huh. you, after you decide it's unhealthy, it seems like you're paying uh, this overhead for like particularly small clusters, right? Kind of like one over K. Right. Uh, or K is the size of the cluster. That you, so you agree that's true? That's right. Okay, all that's right. right. So and, it's, it's, it's log in, it's log in. It's the time that it takes. Oh, that's the convergence time, yeah. That's but right. I'm, I'm talking about like you have this case where you can land on a, a node that's dead that, that you don't know is dead yet. Oh, that's right. Yeah? That's and you right. can also land on a healthy node that sends you to a dead node because that's, it doesn't know. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. Okay. And uh, the second question I had was um, in the RR mode, the non-VIP mode for routing requests, you, for, for large numbers of uh, worker nodes, do you, you subsample there? Because you're limited, right, the number of resource records you can return in that set? Yeah, so uh, what happens is if the DNS record exceeds the size, yep. then it automatically does a TCP request. So we support both UDP and TCP. I so see. The, the client, uh, the, the resolver client will yep. convert into TCP and we support TCP as well. So the request comes back as a TCP and then we return everything. We return gotcha, everything so you'll fall back to TCP. We fall back to TCP, yeah. Thank you, great talk. Sure. Hi, great session. Uh, just a quick question. This morning I was in the, the keynote demo and they were in their Docker Compose and they set the encrypted equal to yes. That's right. I was wondering how that works with the overlay network. Is that turning on IPsec and then related question, do you support IPsec over, over the network for encrypted, uh, like automatic encrypted traffic between uh, That's right. containers on different hosts? Right, so yeah. So we do actually do IPsec uh, on top of overlay. So overlay is done and then we add IPsec on top of it. And also we do the uh, key rotation, so we can do hitless forwarding even in the keys rotating actually. So yeah, yeah. Hi, uh, first, uh, very nice talk, lot of information. We just started using the HRM. Sure. And uh, we noticed that uh, the context routing is not there yet. Okay. We talked to some of the folks. Uh -huh. uh, do we miss anything there, or just, uh, I just want to reconfirm that uh, we are using interlock for the context routing right now, uh, keeping the same DNS just mm -hmm. to swap between the services. So uh, H this talk we, we we concentrate only on the swarm levels of things, right? HRM actually comes at the DDC level, right? So here we didn't cover any talk any anything about the HTTP load balancing at all, right? So I think we should we should have a separate discussion on HRM. 
HRM has a lot more functionality which we can talk in detail. Is it uh, happening in this uh, Docker call? I'm sure it will happen. I, I can forward you some information if you can. Yeah. Thanks. We can do that. Yeah. Hi, uh, Trey from Science Logic. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, my question is if there's any planned support for a use case where you have, say, two uh, like web servers both running on port 80 in swarm mode um, without having to do, say, like reverse proxy or anything like that? Yes. So. Um, so we are support. We uh, we are working on a feature to 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 support other drivers, not just overlay, right? So now we already have we added a feature in 1705, the ability to remove the overlay networking, uh, the ability to remove the ingress network and recreate the way you want to create it. So next we are working on ability to support Mac VLAN drivers with swarm mode, right? And stuff like that. So once you do that, what happens is you can actually expose these uh, ports not just on a global node level IPs, you can specify individual container IP and expose them as well, right? That way we'll be able to, we don't, we're not bound by ports anymore. Once you are able to reach an um, IP directly from outside, a service IP directly, you don't have to buy port mapping, you don't need this port conflict issues, right? Today the reason we have port conflict issues is only because we have to depend on the host IP, and it's shared among all the services, right? So now, we are working towards supporting other drivers, like the Mac VLAN drivers and so on and so forth, which actually allows you to use an IP address directly outside. That way, you don't have this issue of port mapping. We are definitely looking at that, yeah. And uh, to answer the HRM is another answer. HRM actually provides it already for you. That's a layer on top of Docker network, Docker. So HRM, if you look at it, you can see how it's done. Hi, great talk, thanks uh, as well. Um, do you have any plans to make IPVLAN stable on support on, on uh, Lib Network? Um, so IP, uh, Lib Network is an open source project, right? So we, we look for contributions, uh, and, and if not for contribution, at least testing and give us, giving us feedback. So IPVLAN has been in experimental for at least four releases now. Uh, we haven't. We, we haven't heard from folks, we haven't given, folks haven't contributed enough back to, for us to give us any thing, right? So if you're interested, the first thing I would ask you is try it out, give us feedback, where we should improve. The one thing that IPVLAN got stuck is on choosing the routing protocol. So IPVLAN is not so useful without a routing protocol that back with. Should we use BCP as the way to go about? Should we use RIP? Should we have OSPF? We got contributions on BGP, which is a massive code base that came in. We couldn't merge it because it's such a massive thing. It's bigger than Docker daemon itself, right? So we couldn't accept that. So my request to you guys is to give us feedback, and we can move it out of experimental once people have feedback on that. OK. Thanks. Sure. Hi. Thanks for a great talk. Sure. I have one question. Uh, is there a way for a container to tell apart the networks that are exposed to it? It just sees them as ETH 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. But is there a way to actually resolve a name? of the network. Um, For example, of, there's a container. It has an HTTP front network and an internal network. Right. Is there a way for it to tell it apart? Because the IPs can be dynamic, the subnets can be dynamic. Right. So how can it tell them apart? Like, this is the front end and this is the back end. So how do you know? Is, it, is, it the, is this the question? Yes. Um, OK. So you can actually do a lookup. You can do a name lookup. Right. You can do a reverse name lookup. So you can take the IP, and you can do a DNS reverse lookup. You will get the name and the network that it belongs to. Oh, all right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Sure. Two questions. One: uh, Do you have plans to replace IPVS with uh, the BBTT and uh, XD? HTTP. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, that Facebook uses. And the second question is: uh, Do you have any experience or testing that you've done running the overlay network over a different data center in? different geographic location centers. over one in terms of different latencies uh, or uh, how does it perform? Sure. Uh, the first question is about IPv versus BPF, right? Um, so BPF is an awesome, uh, because as, as, as I explained to you guys, right, Docker networking, we will make use of everything that Linux kernel does to offer. Uh, Linux kernel is going to offer this BG, BPF is really awesome for us. But unfortunately, it's kernel 4.8, and the Docker must work, all the features must work with kernel 310. 
and hence we are kind of hand tied with providing such functionality. But what we would possibly do, which we are already working on, is to provide some drivers, BPS specific drivers, which we will pretty much say this will work only with kernel 4.9. Right? That way you can start experimenting with that, try it out in, in, the, uh, in the Linux kit, right? provide a driver, and then make, make, make it see how it works. So we are working on it, we are excited about that, and uh, yeah, we are, we are working with the community as well. That's one. The next question you asked was about uh, one. Sorry? Over one. Uh, VXLAN over uh, the data set, remote data yeah, set. Yes. So yes, uh, we, we have tried it. Um, uh, in fact, there was a Swarm 3K project where like 800 nodes, 3,000 nodes across the, uh, across the continent, right? They all communicate with each other using from one from AWS, some from Azure, some from GCP, some from their home, some Raspberry Pis, all connected from US to Australia. They all connected to a single swarm and we we're able to make it work. But that's not production, right? That's for experimenting to see whether it works or not. When it comes to production, we do have requirements because we have raft protocols, we have gossip protocols, we have other things happening in the network. So there is a recommendation for what is the minimum required latency parameters. And there is going to be a reference guide be released very soon by one of our CS uh, SAs. Once we have, we have clear numbers on what is required in order to provide production grade support for that. But the routing, the routing is aware of the latency is different, so it has the uh, preference to route things first in the local cluster and only then to remove. So, uh, we don't have such support. I'm talking about control plane level. At control plane level, we want to make sure that we don't want your control plane to just keep swap, sure. you know, flapping, right? So we want to provide the guarantee that, hey, this will be production ready or not, for that we have numbers available for you. Uh, other than that, we don't have we don't have the intelligence put inside the road, the data plane yet. Contributions will come. Okay. Great talk. Thank you. So I've been playing with uh, Docker Compose, creating services, and one of the things I was doing was actually trying to give a host name for the container service that's getting created. And I noticed that uh, I'm not able to ping from one host to another host. Okay. If, unless and until the service name and the host name are the same, is that something uh, that you guys are aware of, or I'm trying to figure out if, uh, if that's a known limitation, or am I doing something? Yeah, so, um, okay, <laughs> it's a lot of history behind it. Okay. Uh, in, Docker, in Docker networking, we don't use host name at all for a solution. I see. We use only container names and service names. Okay. okay? That's the reason, okay, so. So it's it, a known issue, or a limitation? It's a known thing. Okay. Okay, so whether it's an issue or thing, <laughs> that's up to you, it's a known thing, yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. With the uh, BXLAN encapsulation, is there anything we have to do or consider with like MTU fragmentation, like um, or path MTU discovery, ICMP, all those little things that'll catch, they catch you off guard. Any considerations there, just in, in terms of the packet length increasing with the encapsulation involved? Right. Uh, absolutely yes. BXLAN does add a packet uh, extra encap, and also if you add IPsec on top, it's going to be even even worse. So. Uh, if you are sensitive to that information, then you have to use the MTU properly. You can configure count, count MTUs appropriately across your network, also on the Docker network. In a clear network, you can specify, specify what the MTU is going to be. That way, we can, we can actually configure the MTUs on both the container level and also the BXLAN level level. So that's something we should do manually, or that will be handled by the... No, it's, we don't have a path MTUs automatically. No. Okay. It's, it's a user must be aware of this. Gotcha. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Sure. It's the last question, and we are wrapping. Okay. Hi, thanks for your talk. It was uh, very great. Uh, last question about overlay network. Is there any limitation or recommendation about how many net uh, overlay networks can be attached to a single container and can be used to a single host? Um, I, I'm not aware of any specific limitation like that. Uh, VXLAN ID itself is 24 bits, so this, we can have so many 2 for 24 VXLAN IDs. That's not a limitation. The limitation, as I know, is it will be the file descriptor. If you have a number of file descriptors in a container, might be the only limitation. Other than that, I don't know of any limitation other than outside of that. Okay, thank you. Sure. So, guys, we have to stop right now, and I'll be available, and also mingle and whatnot. We can we can chat there. Thank you.